Welcome to r slash reddit revenge. This is a story of someone getting back at someone with revenge after being wrong. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel and for so many likes. And today we have three great stories. The first story, oil change place messed up my car, sued and won, forced them to change business name. The second story, drunk boss didn't pay me $700 for my job, so I filed a complaint, quit and then she lost her shop. The third story, woman tried to sell and get more money for the bike, but in the end she was left without money and a buyer. Today's first story is, oil change place refuses to pay for damages. In 1993, I bought a 1992 Saturn. Nice car, low mileage, ran great. I'd been taking my cars to the same place for a few years for oil changes. Place was named after a certain Looney Tunes character that went beep beep, and even used that purple headed bird in their logo. One day in 1995, I had to run an errand across town right after the oil change. Sometimes there might be some smoke from oil getting on the exhaust headers, so I didn't think much of it when I saw a bit right after starting my car. I got on the highway and after several miles noticed smoke was coming out from under the hood. I pulled over and popped the hood to find the oil filler cap sitting in the valley of the valve cover instead of screwed down over the filler opening. Oil was everywhere. Engine bay was soaked. I checked the oil and was two quarts low. I walked to a gas station, got oil and topped it off and turned to head right back to the oil change place. I didn't make it. The check engine light came on, the car started stumbling and running rough, and I managed to make it to the Oldsmobile dealer, thinking GM product. I had done business with before. They took the car in while I called to cancel my appointment and called the oil change place to lodge a complaint. They told me they couldn't do anything. I had to call the boss. I got his number and called. This is where it starts getting fun. He basically told me it was my problem. He changes 90 cars a day and can't be expected to get everyone right. I told him he would be responsible for the damage to my car and he'd be hearing back from me. Old's dealer told me the alternator was saturated in oil, being right behind the oil fill hole, and was shot. They had to go to the Saturn dealer for the alternator as it was not a standard GM part. Next day I get my car back, $450 to fix, needed a battery too. I call the oil change owner and he tells me to send in the receipts. I figure good, gonna get this taken care of in no time. Nope, I call a week later and he says with my car having 52,000 miles on it, he can't be sure it was the oil change that caused it. He even refused a refund on the oil change. The oil caused the alternator to short out, draining the battery dead. It wouldn't hold a charge afterwards so it had to go. Alternators usually last a long time, unless you soak the electronics in oil. Batteries last 3-5 to five years depending on a number of factors. If your alternator goes and you can afford a battery at that time, I'd recommend replacing it. Most mechanics will test the battery anytime the car has trouble starting. I went back and forth with him for three months. He would flip-flop between being cooperative and combative, but never getting anything done. Finally, I decided to sue. I filed and his response to the notification was that he wasn't responsible if his employees messed up someone's car. Since I was and am not familiar with this process, I asked the court clerk what to expect, and she became a library of info. I followed her advice, brought a ton of paperwork, showed up in a suit and tie to court, and explained my case to the judge. The oil change guy showed up in a pair of jeans that should have been thrown in the trash, complained that he was a small business owner, and shouldn't be held accountable for his employees' actions. Suffice to say, judge ruled in my favor. I asked the court clerk what to do next, and her reply was to lay low and do nothing. He had 30 days to appeal, and if I did nothing, he would think I was happy and wouldn't appeal. A month later, she confirmed that he did not appeal. I then sent him a registered letter stating that he owed me the $450 plus $75 for court filing fee. My letter was carefully worded and stated that if he didn't pay, I would file a lien on his business. He called the day the letter was received and told me a check would be in the mail ASAP. It did take another month for the check to come in, but I did get paid. As I mentioned, it took three months for me to get tired of his crap, so I decided to check on whether he had legal right to use the beep beep bird material. Note, this was before the internet days. I made several calls and finally got a hold of W Bros legal department in Burbank, California. The lawyer I talked with was very interested in what I had for her and gave me her mailing address to send the information on the oil change place. A short time later, a friend who knew of my troubles told me I needed to drive by the place, so I did. Less than two weeks after I sent the materials, including a copy of my receipt, the Yellow Pages ad, his business card and photos of the place, the signage was covered with a sheet. No beep beep bird related stuff in sight. A week later, the place had a new name and a new logo. Now, if this guy had just paid for his mistake up front, it would have been simple and done. As he chose to be a jerk, it wound up costing him a lot more. 
He did have to pay for the battery, which was replaced at the dealer. I paid for the replacement oil, two quarts, so he basically paid for all the repair work. What I think is best is my revenge, forcing him to stop violation of trademark law by using the bird. That had to cost him 10 times the repair by changing his company name, logo, all business forms and docs, etc. The next story is, Dock my pay, lose yours. I worked for a small company that repaired stained glass windows for churches, universities, government and historical buildings domestically and abroad. Some high profile jobs too. Anyway, there weren't too many employees, some studio associates and three managers, one being myself, who oversaw different aspects of the operation. The owner, aka Drunk B, was an awful, awful human being, constantly lying to customers, saying she needed to order replacement glass for the job, which cost XX dollars, but in reality she would buy way cheaper materials, or already have said material that had been sitting for decades unused. One day she informed me that I had broken a piece of glass about 12 by 12, she valued it $500, this will be important shortly. It is in fact true that pieces of stained glass can run that much or even more, but I knew for a fact how much this piece cost because two weeks prior she made me drive six hours round trip to pick it up, and I saw the effing invoice. A 3x3 three three sheet cost about $60, cheap stuff. After picking it up I drove it to the drunk bee's personal art studio at her house around 2pm. She was wasted, her teeth crimson with her SH homemade wine. She gifted us a bottle for Christmas one year. I get off track, I apologize. So I show up, she's wasted midday, and she makes me unload a total of about $5,000 of stained glass that she bought for the company into her personal art studio. She stumbles as she's showing me where to put it, and in the process messes up a setting that took about two months to place. Effing slob. Two weeks later she says I broke a piece of glass worth about $500, like I said earlier, and then she informs me that I would be deducted the amount from my paycheck. She would miss paychecks like she missed her mouth after the second bottle of wine. So not only was I not getting my full paycheck, but it would almost definitely be days later when she decided to show up and hand us our checks. I wasn't gonna let her get away with this, and I certainly wasn't gonna quit before I could get my revenge. Lucky for me, we put the invoices in a wall folder for her to reconcile when she decides to stumble in. The invoice was still in the folder, so when she left for her siesta, I took it out, photocopied it and put the original back. The next day she showed up. Two days in a row? Her wine cash must have been low. It happened every now and then. She hands me my paycheck minus $700. I knock on her office door and ask her, Drunk B, my paycheck is $700 short. Do you know what happened? You broke a priceless piece of glass, PHB. I had to pay for it somehow. Here's where the revenge comes in. I manage the materials coming in and out of the shop. I know what we need, how much we use, what we use it for, and all orders for future materials for future jobs. Friday at 4.45. Closing time is 5. Drunk B, what glass? The XX pane that you picked up. There is no XX pane here. The one you brought to my house. Oh, uh, I thought that was your personal material, because if it was for the company and paid for using the company's money, you would have made me bring it here. I work from home. That's why I made you bring it to my house. Drunk B. Oh, okay. It's just I know the current jobs we have going on and all future jobs, and not one requires any of the material you brought for the shop. How I spend my money isn't your concern. Actually, it's literally the definition of my job. Q Monday morning. I don't show up because I know she isn't going to be there after a weekend vendor. I call the Department of Labor and explain that I've been docked wages illegally and falsely. I then write the EPA and explain what I witnessed at her personal art studio. Illegal handling and dumping of lead. Lead came is what used for stained glass windows. I then write to the IRS and explain that she's using company funds for personal expenses. I walked in the next day, told her I quit. Found out she lost clients left and right because of the issues. Tried to sell the company to the remaining employees to no avail, and eventually just closed shop. And the last story is... Craigslist vintage bicycle seller jacks up price between inquiry and my trip to see it. Sweet revenge ensues. Sure, we've all dealt with idiotic Craigslist sellers out there, but this woman was too greedy not to have this coming to her. I collect vintage road bicycles, of which one showed up on our local Craigslist for $100. Being sold by Greedy Bicycle Lady, GBL. It's an upper entry level road bike by one of the better English manufacturers of the 1970s. At best, it's worth $300 cleaned, fixed up, and perfect. As it is now, $200 to $250 tops. I know a good deal when I see one, so I email GBL with my phone number and tell her I can come by within the hour and buy it. Shortly thereafter, I receive this response in my inbox. Okay, so I know I realize that the bike is worth more. I've upped my price to $200. Give me a call if you're interested. It's not as good of a deal as before, but it's still a bike I'd like to have in my collection. 
This time, I call her to confirm an appointment time. I haven't been talking to her for 30 seconds before I'm informed that the price is now $350, based on the latest inquiries she's had, which have been numerous. I don't mind a bit of friendly competition, but this is ridiculous. Sure, she has a right to getting what the market will offer, but deals cannot be made with sellers that cannot stand behind their word. I ask if she's willing to stand by this price if I commit to driving halfway across town to pick it up right that minute. No. Lady, I doubt you'll find anyone willing to put up with this nonsense. I could drive across town and find that you've doubled the price by the time I get there. Good day. Edit. I think it should be noted that I'm really not interested in the bike anymore at this point. Vintage road bikes were unusually common in my city at the time of this story, and I knew with time I could put my efforts towards something much nicer. And I did, with the acquisition of two chrome Schwinn Paramounts shortly thereafter. Not to mention that my collection was already quite sizable. At the time, a fleet of over 15 classic and vintage road and touring bikes. Yes, I had the N equals N plus 1 syndrome quite bad back then. But back to the story. My last email seemed to end any hope of further discussion. But too many old movies have taught me that the greedy person is the easiest to have fun with. Especially when the spare email addresses are close at hand. No longer was it about the bike. Within 10 minutes, GBL had a $500 offer from Mr. A, ready to come by. And 5 minutes later, Mr. B just had to have the bike for $750. And thus, GBL told Mr. A that the price was now $850. So Mr. A confirmed that he'd match that offer, while Mr. B dropped out. But then Mr. C pops up. We'll buy now, no questions asked, $1,500. And of course, GBL will take Mr. C's offer any day of the week. But Mr. C can't commit to show up until the weekend, almost a week later. That's fine with her. Mr. A, however, soon gets an email with a new $1,500 price. Mr. A can match it. But Mr. A drops off the face of the earth come his appointment time the next day. So she tries to get Mr. C back, who confirms for that weekend, then drops off the face of the earth too. The day after Mr. C misses his appointment, Mr. A gets back in touch with our greedy bicycle owning friend, who apologizes for his family emergency. He makes an appointment for the weekend after. And Mr. A misses that appointment too. In the meantime, Mr. B wants to know if she'll do his 750, as the ad still appears to be up. And Mr. B doesn't show up for his appointment. And thus begins a vicious circle of emails from Bicycle Lady to Mr. A, B, and C, as she desperately tries to get at least one sucker with more money than brains to her doorstep, following her three weeks of runaround. Of course, nobody ever replies, and by this point no real buyers from Craigslist are willing to bother with her nonsense either. And so the bike disappears off Craigslist, but almost exactly a year later, GBL posts the bike back up. Same seller name, new pictures, nothing done to improve the bike's condition. The asking price is a flat $500. Thus, I emailed her for my original address, as myself, just to be a pest. Remember me, lady? When you want to talk about that $200 price again, give me a call. Maybe you'll actually get to sell it this time. Rim shot. Rude sellers have a way of ruining the fun of acquisition and ownership. Went on to find nicer bikes at better prices. I hope you love these stories. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to know when the new video comes out.